we've seen that one way we can treat non-ideal gases is uh, by starting with some of the expressions that we develop for ideal gases and then simply substituting this new function the fugacity in for the pressure. So I'm showing this up here at the top. Uh, this is the result we got in the previous video simply to allow you to see the relationship between our expression for an ideal gas and the expression that we would have for a real gas where really the only difference is that we have substituted fugacity for the pressure. Now the uh, in doing this, we've also defined a fugacity coefficient that's equal to the fugacity divided by the pressure. And we saw in one real case that it is around one, uh, but it can vary somewhat if you change the pressure over thousands of bar. Now, what I want to talk about here is a very similar sort of development, uh, but now applied to non-ideal solutions. So I'll remind you that for an ideal solution, we had written down and uh, try to reproduce the, the terminology and the symbology as much as possible, that the uh, chemical potential for a solution might be related to the chemical potential of that component as a pure substance plus RT times the log of its vapor pressure for that component divided by the vapor pressure it would have over the pure liquid. All right, and what we want to do is using this expression relate it somehow in the same way that we did for non-ideal gases. So in other words, we're going to uh, make some alterations to this that will allow us to treat non-ideal solutions. Now one thing that we could do, and uh, I will just say that this would only be true in a very extreme case, is that we might uh, alter this expression to take into account uh, when we have such a large vapor pressure that we might actually have a non-ideal gas in the vapor. And so that would be something that might look like this, where most of the expression is the same, but in place of this ratio we would have log of the fugacity over the reference fugacity. All right, we won't find this expression to be necessarily very helpful uh, simply because most vapor pressures are fairly uh, low pressure, and so we don't tend to run into uh, vapors above a, a liquid that uh, are tending toward non-ideal gases. All right, but we do have instances where um, our solution uh, and the quality of our solution may change the expression that we end up with here. Remember that when we have Raoult's law, in that particular instance, we can relate the vapor pressure to the mole fraction times the ideal vapor pressure. So this term here at the end turns into RT log of the mole fraction. And so this is the part that we want to see how it changes when we go from an ideal solution to a non-ideal solution. So I'll remind you, this is what we find when we have ideal solutions. So we're going to make a very similar sort of change uh, in this when we go to a non-ideal solution. So let me mark this in purple just to put some emphasis on it. So a non-ideal solution is one where we might write the following. The chemical potential of the solution is going to be the chemical potential, well, I better put liquid J uh, as a pure substance, plus RT. And now I'm going to have not log of the mole fraction, but log of another quantity that I'll call A sub J. And this A sub J is something we call the chemical potential. So what you can see here is that we have A sub J goes to X sub J. That is, A, the chemical activity is uh, basically becoming the same as the mole fraction for an ideal solution. But it will also generally be true as XJ approaches 1. So in other words, uh, we've noticed that uh, for non-ideal solutions that they approach uh, sort of ideal behavior for the component that is in the majority, that is the component that is uh, tending toward a pure substance. Now just as we did for fugacity, um, well, um, let me just step back a moment. So really what I'm doing is I'm taking this chemical activity and I'm setting it equal to this quantity here 
because that would cover both ideal and non-ideal cases because pj does not have this part does not necessarily have to be the mole fraction times the uh, vapor pressure of the pure liquid all right so this is in effect going to be our working definition for the chemical activity um, and we know that this trends to the mole fraction as we get to an ideal solution okay so with this uh, definition for uh, for our um, chemical activity we're also going to define a an activity coefficient now I apologize for the fact that we're using the same Greek letter gamma uh, to denote this coefficient but in effect it will be written as the ratio of the activity over the mole fraction so this will be now the thing that will help us uh, track the activity as it changes and this expression up here I should probably put it in red is going to be the one that will basically be our working definition for chemical potential now for a non-ideal solution now I'll note that we, we showed before with the in the case of Henry's law that if one uh, of the two components approaches the Rolle's law behavior as it as its mole fraction approached one that the other component had to approach Henry's law behavior as its mole fraction approached zero we have a similar sort of relationship here because we can express the Gibbs Duhem equation in terms of activities so let me show you what I mean by this so I'll once again write out the Gibbs Duhem equation for us Okay, recall that it's just the mole fraction times the differential of the chemical potential in that component plus the mole fraction of 2 times its differential of the chemical potential is going to be equal to 0. All right. Now, if we write out what the chemical potential for component J is based on this equation, this part is constant, RT is constant because we're going to be at constant temperature and pressure. So, in effect, this differential of the chemical potential is just going to be the differential, sorry, RT times the differential of the log of the activity. All right, so in effect, we're trading the differential of chemical activity for the differential of the log of activity, which also, by the way, gives us a big hint that, in fact, these two are serving much the same purpose in a lot of our thermodynamic relations. Okay, but now if I use this in place of the gibbs duhem equation, I can write a new version for the gibbs duhem equation that looks something like this. I'll have the mole fraction of 1 times the differential of the log of its activity. And by the way, RT is multiplying both of these terms, but I can divide by RT because the right side is equal to 0. And this will be times uh, plus the x2 times the differential of log of a2 is equal to 0. Now, as I said, technically speaking, I should have an rt in front of both of these terms on the right, but if I divide by rt, I can cancel that out to get this. So this, in effect, is our working, um, is our working form for the gibbs duhem equation um, in the case of activity. Now, we could use this to basically show that if one of our components, um, if, for example, if one of our components shows A1 equals X1 as uh, over the entire range of 0 goes to 1 for that mole fraction, then we could also show that the second one will go to its mole fraction uh, as as its mole fraction goes to 1. So very similar to Henry's law. These things are reciprocal in their behavior and this basically tells us that Rolle's law would be obeyed uh, by all components if it's obeyed by one component. So another uh, sort of reiteration of that particular relationship. Now with things like the chemical potential and indeed in terms of the chemical activity because we see that it serves similar functions uh, we find that, in fact, these things are not well defined unless we define a standard state for them. Let me just say a few words about that because in the case of chemical activity, we're going to find that there are two particular definitions that matter a lot uh, when defining a standard state. Now, the first case 
is one that we've been kind of uh, tacitly assuming through most of this uh, most of this module, and that is that our components in the mixture are completely miscible. That is, they mix together at all proportions. So we never get any sort of separation of those two. And we can consider this to be sort of a Raoult's law standard state. And the reason we call it this is because um, in this particular case we're going to have the relationship for the chemical activity that the chemical activity is the pressure over the pressure of the pure uh, over the pure substance and that um, when our pressure goes to its pure vapor pressure our activity is going to go to one so this is behaving in all ways uh, just as we have uh, illustrated up above however there is a second case and I just want you to be aware of the fact that there are these two possible uh, cases for these uh, uh, for these standard states the second case is one where we have a sparingly soluble solute so this might be, you know, an ionic compound that you throw in the water and it's not very soluble, okay, uh, or a liquid that's not very soluble in the liquid that it's thrown into. And in this case, we have a different sort of standard state that we call a Henry's Law standard state because it's defined in the limit as the activity goes to zero. Now, what this means in practice is that, so, let me just expand this territory a little bit. So AJ is going to go to XJ, the mole fraction, only as XJ goes to zero. But we saw in the case of Henry's law that the slope was not equal to the uh, pure substance vapor pressure. It was equal to the Henry's law constant. So that redefines, if you will, our standard state. And I'm going to draw that as mu, mu zero as being our standard state for the pure liquid plus RT times log of the Henry's Law constant for that component divided by the pressure of the pure, the pure vapor pressure of that component. Okay, so we've basically substituted here, um, instead of having just the vapor pressure of the component, which is what it would be in the case of a Roult's Law standard state, um, the Henry's Law constant for this. So this is a little bit different reference state that we're going to be measuring relative to, but it makes better sense for solutes that don't dissolve very thoroughly in their solvent. I hope this has made some sense, but uh, the main point is that we're going to be using activity um, as opposed to pressure for a lot of things in the, coming, uh, in the coming lessons, particularly when we get to the issue of chemical equations and, and chemical reactions. So I uh, want you to be familiar with uh, the idea of activity, and it's basically converting us from an ideal solution to a non-ideal solution uh, in a seamless way.